fancy, but was hand optimized assembler code for the alpha. Oh, did I waste time on that one? <laughs> uh, it was really fast, but yeah, who has an alpha? Uh, yeah, and roughly a year ago, I was sitting at home, basically trying to avoid doing my PhD, uh, and thought, okay, I have all these ideas how to make it compile the code rather than look at it each time and figure out what to do. I'll just try that it works. Just one night. I, it, it's not going to work anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, it did. One night turned into a week, a week turned into a month. Uh, yeah, on, I think, 16th of August was intended to. Yeah, and one of the people who actually contacted me about it was Harald Frank from Germany. And he said, look, we should take this one step further. We should basically make something that you put into your PC and make it into an Amiga. Don't do any of these operating system stuff underneath. He said, let's use ROS as our operating system kernel. And I said, no, no, no. But, okay, I'm a Linux person, so we have Linux underneath, but you don't see it. Uh, and basically ever since, we have been tugging away at it. And one of the things that is a problem with UAE, performance-wise, is the custom chip emulation. Not really because it takes a lot of time. On a machine like this, this is a 1.3 GHz F1. I'm not sure whether it's 1.3 or 1.2 at the moment. On a machine like that, emulating the custom chips doesn't take much time. It's 5% or so. It doesn't really cost you much. What hurts is what you need to do to emulate them. What you need to do in the CPU emulation, you got to count 68K cycles and work out, has something happened in the custom chips yet? No, okay, do another instruction. Has something happened yet? You do all these, has something happened yet shakes. You spend a lot of time on them. So basically what we set up, get rid of the custom chip emulation. This is going to be for serious people doing serious stuff. Who cares about games? If you want to play old games, you probably want to play them because you know them. Which probably means you have the hardware to do it. So why would you want to play them on here? So get rid of the custom chip emulation. Get rid of the floppy emulation. Get rid of the CA emulation. Well, I actually ended up writing a new one. But <laughs> get rid of a whole lot of stuff. And suddenly I could optimize. I could do things which I have very, tried very hard to get back into the normal UAE, and they just don't fit. They break it. So here's an emulator which basically, um, no, I can't get it out. There's a CD in there. It boots off it. There's about three, three megabytes on that CD. I have stacks this high of CDs with three megabytes on them. <laughs> because usually the first one you burn doesn't boot. Uh, it boots that up, and at that moment, this thing becomes an Amiga. Uh, you have full hardware access. The PCI slots are there to go at. The memory is, com well, there's a little bit of memory under Linux control, but the huge majority of memory is completely under AmigaOS control. The addresses, as AmigaOS sees them, are the addresses that are actually physically there. You tell the PCI card to DMA into a certain address, it ends up where you expect it. We have drivers for things like serial parallel. We got a network driver for it for the NE2000 PCI cards, which just, well, it's, it's the old CNET device from AmiNet, with a little bit of messing around with it, so it does PCI cards. It's pretty much, I suspect, where everybody gets their NE2000 PCI card drivers from. Uh, what we also had was an IDE drive. And yes, how do you do IDE on an Amiga 1200? Gale. And you have this horrible, horrible IDE port which does PO mode zero and uh, doesn't even do that very well. <laughs> and we had that working and it really stuck <laughs> because it held the machine back. We had this machine which had a CPU which was running at incredible speeds, memory bandwidth, wow, disk bandwidth 1.5 megabytes per second. Ew. So at one point I basically said, nah, this is crap. 
this is going to be a whole lot of work that you've got to use for Linux IDE drivers. Linux knows how to do all these fancy chipsets that you get in PCs these days. I don't know it. Nobody in Amiga land really knows it. Half of the time you really can't get the documentation. Nobody will write the drivers if we don't use the existing ones. It took about two months to actually get it right. But now there's a device in there that basically says, look, on one hand I talk to the Linux side and I talk directly to the low-level drivers. There's no file system in there or so. It goes, it directly hits the disk. And on the other hand, it looks to the Amiga side like a good old SCSI device. Only it's called differently, so there's no conflict. And with that, uh, I think on this machine I got up to 20 megabytes per second off a very cheap $200 40 gigabyte disk. 20, 20 megabytes. Bytes. Yeah. Of an IDE? Of an IDE drive. A cheap one too. But it's big, right? Uh, that was sustained. I read in a gigabyte in 50 seconds. <laughs> Set up your hardware properly, right? mm. yeah. Well, 80M100, the interface should go up to 100, theoretically. That's a peak rate, right, then. Yeah, that's, that's from the cache, but... like has bit, bit, bits, too. No, it's bytes. Oh, it's bytes. Yep. And, like, the hard drive in here, I basically bought, actually, as a, to store video on it, for which you don't really need much, so I bought the cheapest one I could find. And one day I will get around to put it into the video machine, but kind of migrated into this machine. Yeah, okay, so basically at that point, at one point we sort of had a working product and we talked to some people and they weren't really forthcoming with, about distributing it. So we talked to Amiga and said, look, we got this stuff, do you want it? Do you want to sell it? They said, yay! We have, a, we have an expo in four days, we want to show it. <laughs> that they did. God, you have no idea. I was listening to the webcast. The guy goes, Oh, yeah, here's a 500 megahertz laptop. Kermit, come up and install your stuff on it. <laughs> I had never tried ImageFX before. I don't have the stuff. I was sitting there going, Please don't crash. Please don't crash. <laughs> it didn't. Uh, yeah. Amiga has loudly announced this as the product they're going to distribute. They might have jumped the gun, gun a bit there. But it is going to come out in the near to mid future. It's not quite clear from whom, it's not quite clear for how much, and what you get with it. We're working on that, but it's going to be on the market as a commercial product. Now, in now that I mentioned commercial product, does anybody have a license problem with this? <laughs> they want to discuss. <laughs> well, uh, after the Amiga announcement, I followed the news groups, and there was a lot of talk about. Uh, now, the JIT compiler I wrote, <laughs> I can do whatever I bloody hell like with it. <laughs> I released it for free, but I can also, in addition, have an additional license to say, okay, I'm also selling it. The CPU emulation and the floating point emulation are Dan Schmidt and uh, Hermann Ten Brugger. So, uh, before we even started on this, we contacted both of them and said, look, we want to do this, can we get a license off you guys to do a commercial thing? And they said, yeah, that's all right, no worries. So, this is not under the GPL. <laughs> Fortunately, the, dis the discussions seem to have died down, but I'm sure the moment it hits the market, it's going to pick up again. There's a whole big section on it in here. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Okay, so what does it do? What can it do? Let's, let's try to switch it on. <laughs> this is what the MF1 comes on, I see. Right? At, at the moment, and this is actually, I made this 2 o'clock this morning. <laughs> Latest version. It's the latest version. Even Harald hasn't seen this yet. <laughs> it's a world first. And it's actually, the, it is a world first because it's the first one in the nine series. So far, 
So to start this, all you do is put in the same. Yeah. Like, it's a genuine PC image at the moment, has nothing to boot from. What about Kickstarter images? That's there's about three megabytes on this CD. And as I said, I have stacks by this side of three megabyte CDs. And Kickstart image is part of that. And do you need a license for it? Yes. Yeah. But like the license is going to come with the CD. Yeah. Like this. So you buy it as a package? Yes. Similar to the Cloento type deal? Yep, exactly. This is a boot screen? Yeah. This is now booting the Linux kernel in the background. Uh, at first, I'm a technical person. What the? It stopped for a long time. OK, I'm a technical person. For me, there has to be lots and lots of text scrolling through, telling me exactly what is happening. You show that to people, and they go, what's that? Can you so, get it in the background? Ah, no. It's still the Linux kernel booting. Yeah, but can you see it if you want to? Uh, ah, it stopped there. You, you can. Okay, so I actually spent a whole night just getting rid of the text scrolling through and putting that stupid one on there. But it's worth it, it really draws people in. Wow. And there it is, my workbench. Wow. <laughs> and which one are you running? Uh, this. 3.1 or 3.9? That's a 3.1. It, it runs 3.9 just fine, only I don't actually have a 3.9. Ah. I do not own a license for 3.9. We, we have created images with 3.9 on them for Amiga seeing as they probably should have a license for it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I don't have one. Uh, yeah, this is 1024 by 768 yeah. uh, in 24 colors. Mm, what can we do? Uh, this is actually this hard drive. Uh, first thing we can do is try to get the mouse moving. Ah, too reflective. Interesting. There is it. There. <laughs> this hard drive, it, that is the 40 gig drive, or actually one partition of it, yeah. that is partitioned with the HD toolbox. We actually get the raw hard drive. This is not some image file or something, this is the hard drive. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> the first thing that always impresses people is voxel space. Anybody remember that from Vorbos? Uh, you fly through. Uh, <laughs> this is in 640 by 480. Yeah. Uh, updating it or on average about 140 frames per second. Are you getting the last of me to bit then? That was sort of on par with my PowerPC. Uh, so I think it. Like with the standard settings, I, I was a fair bit ahead because yeah. you had the graphics bottleneck in there. Yeah. Uh, but when we got to the settings where a yeah. lot of time is spent on the calculations, yeah. I think we were both down to something like 15 or so. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, this, is, this machine has a GeForce 2 MX200, which is about the cheapest GeForce 2 you can get. Uh, very cheap now. Yeah, I think it's about 110 without TV out and 100. 25 or so with TV out. And last time we tested this was with, was with a Duron 900, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So how much faster is the um, MF from uh, 1.3? Uh, the, the real F1, for, for things like this, it doesn't make that much difference because you don't actually use that much memory. So the larger second the level cache, cache doesn't used. come in. No? Oh, okay. Not for very small loops like this. Right. Uh, that really shines is something like Poffray. Right. Poffray got about twice as fast. I think some of the speedomet speedometer benchmarks got about got a heck of a lot faster. Uh, well, you should be running. Are you running 266 bus or a 200 <coughs> megahertz bus? Uh, I'm running it on 200 because my motherboard doesn't do more. Okay. So you can actually get a little bit more speed out there. Uh, well, it's an extra 30 percent, which is significant. <laughs> <laughs> hey, bitch! <laughs> That's all. Well, it's like the world's first overclocked Abbey Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, one. <laughs> this is in 1024 by 768 in 24 bits. Uh, it's 
fast. P96 speed. P96 speed, yeah. Now this is slow because it's actually done by the CPU. Like the, the previous rectangle draw was accelerated. That was done by the graphics chip. Uh, this one with a pattern, I didn't bother to accelerate because nobody uses it anyway. Yeah. Uh, and because it's done by the CPU, it's actually done in 68K code. <laughs> because it's basically uh, our, Pic our Picasso 96 driver says, now, I don't know how to do this, you do it. Mm. And then it goes. Uh, that's another thing where this is very different from, uh, from UAE. Here, the screen is directly under the Amiga's control. The memory, the screen memory the Amiga sees is that memory. Uh, the keyboard is directly under the Amiga's control. So the moment you hit a key, the Amiga gets an interrupt. And that is the hardware interrupt the keyboard controller generates. That goes directly to the Amiga. The Amiga picks up the key, throws it onto the screen, and that's right there. Uh, you do that under UAE, running under something. Uh, the operating system gets the hardware interrupt, collects the key, passes it on to the UAE emulator, which then passes it on to uh, the keyboard emulation, which then the Amiga finally gets it, and often it doesn't get an interrupt in between, so it finally gets it sometime, writes into the screen, and the screen it writes into isn't really the screen, so you wait until the yeah. operating system updates the real screen again. And I've had people, lots of people comment how fast this is, citing uh, ratios which are just not true. Like this is, on a good day, on the right test, twice as fast as UAE JIT. Because of all the things I could actually do on Optimize once the custom chip emulation is out. And a few things, you don't really need to give the free people. <laughs> what about software that demands custom chips? What happens? It, it can try to access them. Uh, Would it crash or anything? Yes. Well, it does. <laughs> <laughs> but the good thing is it takes 20 seconds to reboot. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. This doesn't crash. The software uh, might. Yeah. yeah. Because if it expects to get certain values back, as long as you just write, the writes just go nowhere.